and welcome back to physics. Uh, today we are going to take a small tangent from uniform circular motion to talk about gravity. And it's, I say a small tangent because they are totally, totally related, um, but this may seem like it's kind of out of the blue for you. But we are going to talk about gravity today, and more specifically, we're going to talk about what it is universally. Before we get started, I want to show you the homework so you can be on the lookout for how to solve problems like these. You have three of them. One, determine the force of gravitational attraction between the Earth and the Moon. Their masses are 5.98 times 10 to the 24 kilograms and 7.26 times 10 to the 22nd kilograms, respectively. The average distance separating the Earth and the Moon is 3.84 times 10 to the 8th meters. Number two, now determine the force of gravitational attraction between the Earth and the Sun. The mass of the sun is 1.99 times 10 to the 30th kilograms, and the average distance separating the earth and the sun is 1.5 times 10 to the 11th meters. Number three, how do these two answers compare? Answers from one and two. Does this make sense to you, and why or why not? So let's go ahead and get started and try and figure out how the heck we would solve a problem like this. First of all, we need to learn about Newton's law of universal gravitation. So far in this class, we know gravity is what keeps us and other objects on the Earth and not flying off into space. So if the force of gravity is being exerted on objects on Earth, what is its origin? Why are we attracted to the Earth? What's going on here? As you can see in the drawing, it does not matter where the person is standing on the Earth, gravity is always, always, always pulling in toward the center of the Earth. Why does that happen? Well, it turns out that Newton did a bunch of thought experiments and found out, or realized, that the force must be coming from the Earth. So, gravity is originating from the Earth. And he realized that this force must be what keeps the Moon in its orbit. So you can see the moon at night. You can watch it travel across the sky. Um, why doesn't it just fly off into space? Why does it stay where it is? It is because of gravity. And that gravitational pull, or that gravitational force, must originate from the Earth. Gravity acting on the moon, or on a chair sitting on the floor, or on us, is one half of a third law pair. So hopefully you all remember Newton's third law, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. An example of this is if a boxer punches a guy in the face, the guy's face is pushing back on the guy's hand the same amount. So when we think about gravity, the Earth exerts a downward force on you. But Newton's third law tells us you also have to be exerting an upward force on the Earth. We can see that in this picture here. So we have the Earth and we have the Moon. The Moon, we know, is being pulled toward the Earth from the gravitational force. And that's pretty obvious, right? We, the Earth, keep the Moon in its orbit. And that happens because of gravity. However, because there is a force acting on the Moon from the Earth, there also has to be a force on the Earth from the moon. And they are equal in size and opposite in direction. So as we pull the moon toward us, the moon pulls us toward it. The reason why we are not in orbit around the moon is because of Newton's second law. Force equals mass times acceleration. The amount of force on the moon and the earth are exactly the same. But the masses are very, very different. If we have a really large mass, we know it's not going to accelerate very much for a given force. But if you have the same amount of force on a much smaller mass, it will accelerate much, much more. And that's why the moon orbits us, and we do not orbit the moon. However, we do orbit something. We orbit the sun. And the reason why we orbit the sun is because the sun is much more massive. The sun has its own gravitational field, and we are attracted to it. Because of Newton's third law, we also know that then the sun is attracted to us with the same amount of force. 
but because the sun is so much bigger than us, we orbit around the sun instead of the sun orbiting around us. So gravitational force must be proportional to both masses. That means the masses of each object is going to affect how much gravity there is. By observing planetary orbits, Newton also came to the conclusion that the gravitational force must decrease as the inverse of the square of the distance between the masses. So what the heck does this mean? Well, in general terms, that means as distance increases, gravitational force decreases. The farther things are away from each other, the less gravitational force there are, will be between them. And up here, as mass increases for our given objects, gravitational force also increases. For example, I am gravitationally attracted to the Earth, and so is this building. Which one will be gravitationally attracted more? Well, the amount of force pulling between those two objects is going to be greater for the building because it has a much higher mass. It also turns out that because distance increases and gravitational force decreases, when you stand on the top of a really, really, really tall building or you're in an airplane, the amount of gravity acting on you, the force of gravity pulling you back toward the Earth, is actually a tiny bit smaller. It's pretty much insignificant at those distances, but it is in fact smaller. So we can sum up these two rules of mass and distance changing in something called the law of universal gravitation. And this is a very, very important law and I want you to write it in your notes. So it tells us that the force of gravity between two objects is equal to g, which is a constant. g is always 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11th times the masses multiplied divided by the distance between those two objects squared. I know r is usually radius, but here we're really talking about the distance between them. So take a second to write that down. I am doing that right now. So let's talk a little bit about this r squared on the bottom and what that means, because it's actually really important. So firstly, this law is an example of something called an inverse square relationship. And this pops up all over in physics, all over the place. We'll see it again when we talk about electricity and magnetism. So what it means is as the distance between two objects increases, the force between those objects will decrease by a square. And this is not an equation, it's called a relation. This little symbol right here that kind of looks like a weird fish, that means proportional to, and that is actually different from equal to. When you have something that has an equal sign, that means you can put numbers in and you can solve for it. Whenever you have something proportional, that literally is just telling you what kind of shape that graph would make or how these numbers are going to interact with each other. So for example, if we double the distance from an object, the strength of the force goes down by a factor of four. How? Well, let's take a look at this. So we have force is proportional to one over r squared. If we plug in 2 for r, we double it, it becomes 4. So force must go down by a factor of 4. Same thing if the distance triples. 
If the distance tripled, the force goes down by a factor of nine. You take the number that you multiply your distance by and you square it to find out how much your force will change. So if we quadruple the distance, your force will go down by a factor of 16 or four squared. And it turns out that this is a really important relation because it tells us that when things are really close to one another, this force can be fairly strong. But as you move even a little farther away, this force will become very, very weak very quickly. A second note about this formula is that Newton did not figure out the gravitational constant G. So G is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11th. This is a tiny, tiny, tiny number. So imagine that is what it is written out. It's ridiculously small, and that means it's ridiculously hard to measure. So Newton never actually figured it out. This was determined by Henry Cavendish. And there's something called the Cavendish experiment that he used that can, it involves some very expensive apparatus. Um, and he found the density of the Earth and used that to figure out the gravitational constant that makes this formula work properly. So now that we know the origins of this equation, let's try a sample problem. So it turns out that anything that has mass gravitationally attracts anything else with mass. For example, you might be sitting in your room right now. You have mass. Everything else in your room has mass. That means you are gravitationally attracted to everything. You are gravitationally attracted to your roommate or your desk or your laptop or your pen or your bed or your pillow or your dirty shoes that are in the hallway. You are gravitationally attracted to all of those things. The gravitational force between those two things will vary depending on the mass and how far away they are, but you are still gravitationally attracted. Kind of a cool thought. You are gravitationally attracted to the nearest star in our uh, solar system, right? To the sun. You, little tiny person, are actually gravitationally attracted to the sun. Because the sun has mass and you have mass, so you are gravitationally attracted to each other. And the amount of that force between those two objects can be calculated using our new fancy equation. So let's do a sample problem. Let's determine the gravitational pull between, let's see, Mr. LaCase and Sam Hall in morning meeting. They sit pretty close to each other, or stand pretty close to each other in morning meeting, and it turns out they are gravitationally attracted to each other. So let's say that they are standing two meters apart. Well, let's look at our equation. Our equation for universal gravitation is G times m1 m2 over r squared. Hopefully, you're looking at this right now saying, wait a second, we do not have enough information to solve this problem, because you would be absolutely right. We are trying to solve for the gravitational pull between them. We know G is always 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. Always, always, always. So we know that. We also know that the distance between them is two meters. What we're missing right now are their masses. So let's go ahead and assume that both of them have a mass of 70 kilograms, making it easy. Let's go ahead and put these numbers into our equation. We're solving for gravitational force. G is always 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. The mass of Mr. LaCase is 70 kilograms, and we want to multiply that by the mass of Sam Hall, which is also 70 kilograms. And then we divide that by the distance between them squared. Make sure you square this number. That is super important. So the order of operations to solve something like this is first, you want to multiply 70 times 70. So 
force of gravity is equal to 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 times 4,900 divided by 2 squared. The next step is to divide 4,900 by 4 because 2 squared is equal to 4. So when we divide that by 4, we get 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 times 1225. And the last step is to multiply 1225 by g. And when you do that, we find that the gravitational force of attraction between them is 8.2 times 10 to the minus 8. Units, well, this is a force, and all forces are measured in newtons. This is not a large force. In fact, this is a very, very, very small force. And this makes sense, right? You don't go around walking uh, and being pulled gravitationally to people when you're walking around as they get closer to you. It just doesn't happen. And that's because this constant is so small that for masses as small as ours, the force of gravitation between objects is pretty much insignificant. It starts becoming significant when objects get as big as the Earth. That is why we are gravitationally attracted to the Earth, because its mass is so large that the gravitational force is then large enough to have an effect on us. So hopefully that made sense to you. Uh, we will talk about this in class a little bit more, but I want you to try these homework problems um, and have them ready to turn in the next time I see you.